Hi, I'm Raymond Simonson. I'm the CEO of JW3, London's Jewish Community Centre and the UK's only Jewish arts and culture venue of its kind. Sadly, as you know, we've had to temporarily close our doors at the moment. Um, we've got to think about people's health and safety and we're listening to government advice. But just because we've stopped doing what we normally do in the way that we do it, it doesn't mean we have to completely stop what we're doing and what we're best at. And that is to increase the quality, variety and volume of Jewish conversation in London and beyond. So we've got some treats for you. We are going to put on a whole load of our digital archive that we've been building up over the last six years of some amazing events. We're gonna make them absolutely free of charge to you. And whilst you sit down with a cup of tea and put your feet up and watch this amazing thing you're about to see now, our team are gonna be planning for a whole bunch of events that we're gonna put on digitally over the coming months. For now, this one's on us, it's free. But you know, everything that we do costs money. And at the moment, we don't have the same income streams that we've got. So if you can spare a few pennies, a few shekels, if you can click donate online, that'll be really wonderful. We'd be so grateful for it. If you can do that, that's great. But either way, please sit back and enjoy. We'll see you again soon. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to JW3, especially anyone here, if it's your first time, welcome. <laughs> It's particularly good to see so many people here on such a busy night for the Jewish community. You probably know there are, I think, six events at Jewish Book Week tonight. It's a big deal for the Jewish community. There's a big event at Bicom. Uh, and the biggest event, of course, for the Jewish community tonight is the Spurs uh, Champions League match. But, so nobody tell me the score until after the game. Thank you. Um, please, if you haven't already, just turn your phones on silent. Turn your flash off of your phone if you, if you want to take any photos and... Uh, Feel free to tweet about it, as we said. You can't have an event without people sticking things on social media. Just please turn the flash off. So this event is really uh, important for us at a time when conversations about Israel within the Jewish community often seem as painful and as fraught to me as conversations about Israel outside. And it's hard to tell the difference sometimes. The way we talk to each other, or rather shout at each other about Israel um, can often be very painful and many of you here were sitting in the room last summer where we held an amazing event with the UJA called Ceasefire which was really about can we get together and talk about Israel without screaming at each other because at JW3 what we want to do is to raise the quality of the conversation and tonight we're bringing you a very high quality conversation and your part to play will be when we come to the Q&A um, we'll give you a chance to to ask questions we'll ask you to Pick up on that uh, uh, high quality that you've heard in the first part of this and ensure that your questions um, meet that same standard. And also, it's fine if you disagree with anything any of our speakers say tonight. We just ask you to disagree respectfully and kindly. And remember that a lot of people find JW3 to be their home away from home. So we'd like you to act tonight towards our guests as if they were guests in your own home. You can agree, you can disagree. But let's do it as friends. Can we all agree to that? Is that okay with you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, that shouldn't need to be said, but I find in these times it needs to be said. So I'm going to do the briefest of introductions because I think you know who our speakers are. Um, we are absolutely delighted after visiting JW3 a couple of times, we finally managed to find a date where Isaac Bougie Herzog has managed to join us on the stage. Uh, you probably all know that as of last year, he became chair of the Jewish Agency. If I was still there, I'd call him boss. Um, he's a former leader of Israel's Labour Party, I should qualify, Israel's Labour Party. Uh, it would be a very different story if he was the leader of the La Labour Party here. Um, a former government minister, including, and this is relevant to us, uh, minister for the diaspora and the fight against anti-Semitism. How we could do with you now. Um, sitting at the other end, a, a figure familiar to, I'm sure, everyone in the room, Sir Mick Davis, someone who was my boss when he was chair of the UJA now Chief Executive of the Conservative Party, one of really the key philanthropists and leaders of the British Jewish community, has held many roles over the years, including as Chair of the UJA, Chair of the JRC and others. And it's a uh, delight to see you back on the UJA stage. Uh, and finally, someone who I know needs no introduction, and I'm sure the rousing applause that she's going to get when I stop talking in three seconds will show her how grateful we are for everything that she does for this community and for being here tonight. One of the community's great friends, uh, MP for Enfield North, former Labour Party MP, now uh, uh, part of the independent group, the chair of LFI, and 
unfortunately for her, her, her great friendship and uh, bravery of being a friend of the Jewish community has led, as you will have all read, to abuse and death threats. So we're going to show her how welcome she is here. And how Everybody hear me? I'm sat on the microphone. <laughs> That's a lovely, warm welcome, and I really appreciate it. Um, just a few words, really, about the last um, couple of weeks, uh, which have been a little bit tumultuous, you might say. Um, I think anyone who's involved in politics here or in Israel knows that there is Although our party systems are different, Bougie, there is a tribal kind of element to our politics. Um, and despite internal disagreements, many of them often very heated, um, our loyalties are a little bit like those, I suppose, that people might feel towards, say, their football team, or even more profoundly, say, to their religion or their family. So it is. Um, it is a very big thing to leave your political party after 38 years. But for me, as hard as that is, and as sad as I was to have to do that, it's perhaps the easiest decision um, I've ever made, at the point at which it had to be made. Um, I made a commitment to the Jewish community at the LFI lunch in November, that whatever the personal cost, I would stand by the community. And I knew when Luciana Berger said the Labour Party has become institutionally anti-Semitic, that that's exactly what it had become. Um, and I could no longer stay in the Labour Party knowing that, knowing that it wasn't being tackled and couldn't be tackled because it comes from the very top because it's intimately related to the politics of the hard left that now dominate our party, to the people who brought that in, who control all the levers in the Labour Party at every level. I could not face my voters and say, I think Jeremy Corbyn is fit to be Prime Minister of this country. I could not see a young Jewish woman driven out of our party by anti-Semitic abuse and nobody from the leadership reaching out to her. If I couldn't stand in solidarity with her, then my values would have meant nothing. Um, and they do mean a great deal to me. I finish by saying I haven't left the Labour Party. It left me. My values are the same. And those values are about the founding principle of labour equality, about solidarity, about every human being matters and is of value about fairness, respect and dignity. And I feel that at the moment has left the Labour Party and I can't honestly see the way back. So I'm in a different group now and we're working very hard and I thank you ever so much for your support. Okay, we're going to um, make a start. I think I've said more than enough, and we need to hear from um, our, our two guests. They've had their introduction, so I won't reintroduce them, and I think you all know exactly who Isaac Herzog and Nick Davis are anyway. So, I'm going to um, start with you, Bougie. You've been in your role at the Jewish Agency now for almost a year? No, no, six months. <laughs> Sounds, looks like a year. <laughs> okay. So what have been the main challenges? First of all, again, I start by applauding you. Uh, John, you're a great friend. You're a sister, as we call it in Hebrew. In Hebrew, there's a, like a real, you're a real sister to us. I know John for many years. As I was leader of Labour, she was the leader of LFI. And I would just say in two sentences, you know, you follow, you follow in the footsteps of Lord Balfour, and great, great British statesmen who are marked in golden letters in the history of the Jewish people and the State of Israel. 
and what you've done shows immense moral clarity. I know how difficult it is to leave your own base, but I'm sure it will turn out for the better. So thank you greatly for what you've done. Thank you. So the issue of the Jewish people is always, always incredibly challenging. I read the trilogy or the books of Simon, Professor Simon Sharma, the, the story of the, of the Jews. And you see uh, in each generation, as we say in Pesach, there is another challenge. So the challenges of this era are unique, uh, incredibly unique. In, in each community, in fact, we would discuss something else. Here in England, we know exactly what we're discussing. But it could be uh, in Germany, whereby 300,000 Jews from the former Soviet Union <coughs> decided to establish about 100 new Jewish communities. It could be in North America, whereby the issue of the future of uh, Jewish continuity is really very much apparent in American uh, Jewish quarters, and so forth and so on. So the challenges are big, and for me, the, the thing that brought me on board, above, way and above the challenges, is, of course, how do we make sure that the two main pillars of the Jewish people, six million Jews in Israel, and I would say six million Jews in North America, plus two and a half million Jews in the rest of the world, especially uh, in Europe, how do, they, how do they get along? It's a, it's a unique challenge that before 48 was not, in, was not there. Do, how do we prevent these communities from growing disparate? How do we keep the unity of the Jewish people? How we, do we discuss Israel in the heart of the Jewish people? It's going to be discussed till tonight. And how do we make sure that people get to know each other? And the Jewish agency being the biggest Jewish organization in the world, a historical organization, the organization that gave birth to the State of Israel. I come into my work every day and sit in Ben Gurion's chair, humbly, and I always remember where it started. But now these are different challenges which I need to lead as far as I can. And I would end by saying, of course, that we're also, by law, in Israeli law, we are the only global partnership between Israel and the diaspora. So the challenges are huge and they actually intriguing and fascinating and I'm here to discuss them in full force tonight. Thank you, DJ. Can I turn to you, uh, Nick? Since leaving your um, positions in the Jewish community, you've continued to speak out about the relationship between Israel and diaspora communities, um, sometimes with some controversy. So, what do you see as the main issues facing that relationship? Thank you very much, and also let me just say how, how great it is to be sitting on a stage with the two politicians of the highest integrity and the highest principle. I've known Bruji for such a long time, he's a great friend of mine, um, and he stood out as being the, the politician of integrity. Uh, in Israel, and, and John, we've said so much about you, and we will not also. Um, I, uh, I speak about Israel partly because I'm a foolish man, um, because <clears throat> yeah, there's no uh, there's no value added to me personally uh, in doing it. Um, but I speak out about it because I feel intensely that the uh, the future of of of, of, of Jewish peoplehood. Uh, is uh, is going to be determined by this relationship between Israel, the nation state of the Jewish people, and all of the Jewish people. Um, and I think the biggest challenge that I think that faces that relationship between the nation state and the Asper jury is that there is a lack of symmetry in that relationship. So the Asper jury, who participated in the creation of Israel, um, who have invested um, energy, have invested money, have sent their children over, uh, who have done all these things, have a very clear understanding of what their relationship with Israel is. Israel sits at the epicenter of their Jewish identity um, and is fundamental to that. Um, and they have a very clear view of what the obligations are to the State of Israel. Um, they maybe don't have a very, as clear a view as I have what their rights are. 
but certainly they have a very clear view of their obligations. And they see their success and their vitality vested in a vital state. The challenge, I think, is that Israel doesn't get that diaspora, doesn't really understand diaspora jury, has no affinity for diaspora jury. I think there's still, it is, it is perhaps a remnant of the view that prevailed at the time that diaspora communities were a temporary phenomenon, that they would disappear over time, that they were communities constituted by people who did not have conviction. If they had conviction, they would be in Israel in any case. Um, they are uh, communities which, other than the, the, the strictly orthodox, would ultimately wither on the vine through assimilation. And if that is your construct of how you perceive diaspora jury, then it is very difficult to actually create a dynamic relationship. And I think that this is something that we have to, we have to get to grips with. I think our big challenge, of course, is that the language of the Jewish people is spoken in Israel and very rarely spoken in the diaspora. It would be a great thing had we followed the traditions of the Greek community for as an example, uh, where diaspora Greek communities, their language is Greek. And it's, a, it's sadness for me because I think actually if, if Hebrew had been truly the language of the Jewish people, uh, many of these issues might not be as apparent today as they are. So, I mean, I think this is, this is in, in, in a sort of philosophical sense, is, is, is the, the biggest challenge that I think, uh, that I think we face. Um, there, are, there are enormous immediate challenges that some people in the diaspora community have in terms of their, where they perceive how their values connect or disconnect from Israel, but I'm sure that's a discussion that we can get onto later in the evening. So, Bridget, would you agree with that? And, and in addition, can I ask, how important are diaspora Jewish communities to the state of Israel, okay. in your opinion? So, first of all, just for full disclosure, as Mick was discussing, our friendship is one of my closest friends on earth, so uh, it is taken into account when I'm very restrained. But I would say, and Mick knows Israel really well, but the truth of the matter is that, that these, um, I would say, declarations are not always accurate. I truly believe that Israelis have huge respect for the diaspora, <coughs> except that they don't exactly know where to fit it into the in, inner scale or, or perceptions of life, because life goes on. When life goes on, you prioritize. When you prioritize, you deal first and foremost with issues pertaining to your own well-being and, and to the nation where you live or the country you live in. I can tell you outright, I know it from data, I know it from my own experience of joining the Jewish Agency and hearing what's going on in various quarters of Israeli public life, that there's immense respect for the diaspora, there is lack of knowledge, lack of understanding and lack of knowing what to say about it. Because there's kind of a um, duality in the attitude. In the original attitude was, as Mick said, uh, negating the diaspora. There were some philosophers out there in the beginning of the state that said it will never go away and please use it and deal with it in a different way. But the narrative, that was the narrative. Today, people understand the diaspora, the Jewish diaspora, Jewish world is part of life of a larger scale. And then how, what do we do with it? How do we deal with it? So what I've put on the table as one of my top priorities is actually to teach Israeli leadership, opinion makers, and the public at large about what it's all about. And I, and I know because of what people term as the rift, that I start a lot with Orthodox communities and rabbis, of course, opinion makers, and I teach them. First, I ask them to keep quiet before they say anything and learn and understand that it's a, it's a whole world out there and it's, these communities are out, out, that are there to thrive and prosper, and we have a duty and obligation to see how, how we support and help our brothers and sisters uh, world over. And there is an inner change within Israeli bureaucracy and governmental affairs towards that end. And I also go to communities all over the world, such as this, but definitely in North America, and I tell them what you read, especially in the Haaretz or the New York Times, is not the Israel that you think it is. Israel is ever-changing, ever-fascinating, 
ever multifaceted, ever interesting, and has undercurrents that are unknown from the outside. And our obligation is to find a bridge. That's why we have, for example, here in England, we have young shlichim, or pre-army, or pre or gap year kids in the communities, in schools. That's why we bring people, and we bring people to Israeli experiences, simply to get to know better. And yes, we will need a lot of political decision making later on as to the relations with the diaspora. Because our nation hasn't sat down and said, okay, how do we define our relationship with the diaspora? I will end by telling you, as Mick mentioned Greece, for example, that we, the Jewish Agency, have an agreement with the governments of Cyprus and Greece on, on educating them on how to operate with the diaspora, because they came to us to learn. They were last week in Israel, top officials, and they were so envious. But what I learned was that the Cypriot uh, diaspora here in England is the biggest, 350,000, and they would like to copy from us, me, on how we work together with the diaspora. So it goes both ways. <laughs> well, I'm, let me just give a quote from Samir, who will bear with me. He said, for the diaspora Jew, connectivity to Israel keeps them Jewish. For the Israeli Jew, the same can be said of connectivity to the diaspora. The relationship between Israel and the diaspora is crucial to the survival of the Jewishness of both. But the foundations of that relationship are rotting and need urgent repair. Do you still hold to that view? Yes, I read it quite recently, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't change It's a very um, kind of out there view, isn't it? It's yes, no, it is. Uh, and it was in response to the questions, questions about um, you know, what is the center ground of UK Jewry and what is the relationship of, of, of diaspora Jewry with Israel. Um, you know, is, Israel was established clearly in, 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 in a number of different contexts. It was, it was established at a time when the Jewish people had gone through the greatest trauma ever. <clears throat> and uh, it was established as, as a safe haven and a, a place where refugees could come and make a place and be their home. Um, it was established on the basis of, of lofty ideals and values, um, of, uh, of, of, of the respect of the dignity of man, of, uh, of, of the creation of equality within society, of the recognitions of the rights of people, of compassion for the poor and the destitute, and to build a society which was centered on these propositions, and although many of these propositions are now universal propositions, they find their source in Torah, and they were unique at the time. So whatever you think whether the Torah was a mythology written by, written by men or the inspiration uh, of the divine, these were propositions which were unique in, in, in their time, and these are the propositions, the bedrock of the way the Jewish people, in fact, have thought of themselves and how they have survived and how they actually have been such a massive contribution uh, to the development of societies across the world. And it's these issues which are challenged today in Israel. And, uh, and when they are challenged today in Israel in terms of perceptions of a society which doesn't in fact propagate these values, and whether it is the symbolism around the nation state bill, the, the lack of compassion for refugees, uh, the divisions within Israeli society that take place, the, uh, the lack of willingness uh, to address inequalities amongst uh, non-Jewish uh, non uh, uh, citizens of Israel, etc. When these things take place, it, it, it creates a tremendous gulf and challenge between the diaspora Jewry and Israel. Now, I know that I'm not speaking of every diaspora Jew, and I know there are people in this audience and others who might think what I'm saying is, is horrific, but I'll talk for the center ground of, of diaspora communities. And so it was meant to be provocative when I wrote that. But it is an urgent thing that actually needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed, in my view, because it is an existential threat to the continuity of Israel. You know, when, when we as, as uh, it's so often said to me um, that I've got, I have to be cautious about one, saying that I have a right to criticize what goes on in Israel, and I have to be cautious about what I say, 
because, um, because in case I give succor to Israel's enemies. Um, my concern is that, that security for Israel is obviously paramount, and I would never do anything to undermine Israel's security. But security goes beyond having the great army of Israel <coughs> protecting the people, on, uh, protecting our borders. Mm. Security is about the coherence within society and the ability of society to function in, in a way which is uplifting and which actually grows value propositions. And my big concern when I wrote that is I see this functionality within Israeli society today and I see it spill over into attack on value propositions which every Jew should hold dear. And that, to my mind, separates or creates a separation potentially between the Aspen Jewry and Israel. And supportive politicians, we often say, um, look at Israel. Despite all the problems, the only democracy in the and, Middle East. And it's fantastic. And I can. And, and, I can and we need to yeah. be able to continue uh, to say that, for sure. Oh, absolutely. And it is a fantastic democracy, and it is a great example of nation building in so many respects. Oh. And, and, you know, there's a. There's a kibbutz that, that, that um, Bougie and I know very well called Kishorit. And Kishorit is a, is a kibbutz whose members are people with special needs. And for me, it represents the very best, the very best of what Israel is all about, and which, which makes me so uplifted whenever I visit it, because not only do I feel in tune with what Kishorit is about, I feel in tune with Israel as well, because there it shows compassion for people who have... Uh, and lives which are disadvantaged. Mm. For creating a space for people to actually um, find meaning within an environment where they are respected and, and they can feel respected. But it goes beyond that because they have reached across to Arab communities, Arab people with special needs in Arab communities and find a connection with them. So it, it represents for me everything about Israel that I love and the reason why I, you know, I, I remain so connected. Um, but yes, so we should celebrate all these things, but we shouldn't hide away from the challenges that we have today. Bougie, is it legitimate for diaspora communities to criticise Israel? When? How? I mean, so what constitutes so acceptable so Jewish criticism of Israel? No, we, live in a, well, sorry. <clears throat> we live in an open world and you can't hide your thoughts and feelings. And I think it's perfectly uh, legitimate to say and criticize and comment and advise uh, from the diaspora jury, even if we don't want to, it's a fact of life. And actually, I have no problem with it. And I respect that. It's uh, what you call in Hebrew, pizzeo have wounds of the lover. But I would say I, I want to balance a bit what Mick said. Because I think part of it comes from a certain ideology that, uh, of course, I fully respect, but all I'm saying is it's no different from any other society. So you're looking at Israel as a beacon among the nation, and I look at British politics and British democracy as beacon among the nations, and all of a sudden I see one pillar of that democracy being <coughs> fully con contaminated with anti-Semitism. So I don't justify either, God forbid. But all I'm saying is we live in an era of major changes in human behavior and mode in politics, and Israel is, has not escaped from that as well. I'm the last person who one can say has not attacked or bashed this government, our government. I'm all on record with terrible things I've said on our government. But that's part of a political debate in parliament or, in, or on the media, which is legitimate in any democracy. That doesn't mean for a second that I doubt Israel's democracy. I'm extremely proud of Israel's democracy. And I try to, remember, to tell people all the time, with all of the situations that we have, we're incredible. The fact of the matter is that in our parliament there are Muslim Brotherhood MPs. Muslim Brotherhood, that's not legitimate in the Middle East at all, and definitely not around the world. And when there's, God forbid, a terror attack, the first ones who get up are them and to blame the government and the people and the military of Israel, which is almost an absurd scene. But that's the beauty of our democracy, and it will go as far as possible. Shows the strength of our democracy. Now, I'm telling you seriously, Mick, the amount of um, collective responsibility in Israel is enormous. I see what my kids go in the army. I see the values that they bring with them. I even see the Elor Azaria case, which everybody thought as a shock, a soldier who killed a terrorist, 
and was indicted as a test and proof of the fact that our legal system is still sustainable and strong. The fact that our Prime Minister is under indictment is another proof of the strength of the system because it shows that the legal system and the rule of law is still there. It's true, there is a major debate on a lot of undercurrents in our society which bother many of us, but that doesn't mean that it's over or lost or that Israel is therefore in a rotten basis as you wrote or things like that. It's not true. I think things need to be taken in proportion. There are phenomena, human phenomena, that unfortunately you see them from the United States to most of the democracies around the world, and we, are, we were hit by it as well. But that doesn't mean that the case is closed and that it's a hopeless case. I absolutely don't agree with it. And I do take into account voices in the diaspora because I think they're vital, because in the diaspora, the Jewish world, is part and parcel of our being. You are our brothers and sisters, and in a modern day and age, you actually live in Israel, and you travel from Israel, you go back, and you have fought, and you have family in Israel, so it's one big mishpacha, and we're entitled to hear, and we are obliged, so you're entitled to say what you want, and we are obliged to hear it. But all I'm trying to say, give a fair chance to a more balanced picture. Wait, let me just move it along a little bit. Um, I'm sure we've all noticed, actually, that there's been <clears throat> an increase in um, anti-Zionist discourse in what we would consider to be progressive spaces. Um, and certainly that's had a big impact on, on me and on Labour Friends of Israel, on Conservative Friends of Israel. Um, what impact, if any, does that have on Jewish connections to Israel? Well, Submit. yeah. Um, well, I think first of all, you're right. There has been, um, and you know, I, I think many people, many Jews, feel that the current trend of anti-Zionist rhetoric um, is um, the sort of modern form of the new, or the acceptable form of anti-Semitism. And um, you know, when we had um, 18 months ago the uh, the, the select committee. Um, review into anti-Semitism, um, I made the point that because identification with Israel sits at the very heart of Jewish identity, the point I made a little earlier, that if you try and separate a diaspora jury from Israel, which is essentially what the, the anti-Zionist rhetoric is trying to do, you actually are attacking the very essence of their Judaism. And therefore, yeah, in, in, from, from that perspective, I see it as a reach into anti-Semitism. Um, and so it is very deeply troubling. I think also the construct of, 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 of a lot of the anti-Zionist uh, rhetoric comes from the world view of people who propagate it. That they see Israel as a child of an imperialist power in the United States of America, um, and, and therefore because they think that the imperialist power is corrupt, its creature is corrupt as well. And fundamentally, it, is no, it has no legitimacy. Um, and if you attack the legitimacy of Israel, as opposed to government policy or solutions or, or lack of solutions with, um, with, with the Palestinian, uh, Palestinian people and things like that, if you tackle legitimacy, then that is a much, much directer and, and a more focused attack on people's identity. So the challenge, therefore, for young people today as they face this onslaught, and it is an onslaught, especially at the universities across campuses here in the United States, in South Africa, where, where I come from, it's particularly pernicious uh, in Australia. The challenge for them is, is how do they respond to that? And for many of them, the response is to actually just step away from it. And if they step away, they step away and they are lost to us, I think, profoundly forever. Because you can't step away from Israel. You can't step away from associating yourself with what is the greatest creation of the Jewish people since maybe we built the temple. You know, the, the, the creation of the modern state of Israel. You can't step away from that and maintain your integrity as a Jew. And I think that, for me, is the biggest concern that we have. That we, we simply are not equipping young people today sufficiently well enough 
for them to combat this assault on the legitimacy of what is the greatest and most impactful part of their genius. If I can add to it, I can agree I add to the question? Comments. So you can please, please do comment on, on on that. But talking about progressive spaces, um, Prime Minister Netanyahu recently made a deal with the far right Otsma Yehudit party, um, and was criticised by a whole range of pro-Israel voices around the world. I wondered what. Does that criticism show us about the diaspora-Israel relationship? Well, first, we have to speak with, about not the pro-Israel forces, but the anti-Israel forces. So there is a very unique uh, situation whereby there is a cocktail of extreme voices, and they, which, which at the end their common denominator is Israel bashing or Jewish bashing. Extreme fascist right, uh, with, with, with regular, I would say, anti-Semitic traits, coupled with extreme leftist voices who base themselves mostly on anti-Israel and BDS, Be, uh, growing under the hotbed of uh, social networks, <laughs> creates a very complicated phenomenon for us. We have fellows on campuses, I urge you to invite them uh, as part of the Jewish community, uh, agency activities, I hear what they are going through. There are also very positive voices, not only negative on campuses. You need to identify them and strengthen their sense of self-confidence. But there is one very disturbing phenomenon now in the United States in the, on campuses, which is called intersectionality, mm -hmm. which means that you can become, be a feminist, you can be a, you know, pro-peace, but if you say I'm a Zionist, you're kicked out of the fraternities or from the lucrative forms of, of, of the student body. It's, these are phenomena that are what scare young Jews away. And they say to themselves, why do I need this headache? I don't want to be involved anymore. And turn them off. This is the real battle that we are focused on these very days. Now you mentioned something that has to do with Israeli politics. Uh, and John, and I want to make it clear. Look, the most of the Israeli society um, feels enormous disgust as to these the voices of that little party. They are disciples of Rabbi Meir Kahan, a rabbi that my late father Chaim Herzog, as president of Israel, refused to accept in the president's home when he was elected to the Knesset in 1984. And, uh, and, and because of the lessons of history. So I, my own judgment is that Israeli body politic will not permit that uh, voice to be heard in the Knesset. That's my own assumption. I hope that will be what will be. And I urge the diaspora jury, they can voice and say their opinion about it. Many of us in Israel will agree, but just to take it with the right proportion. Namely, if the Supreme Court of Israel enables that party to run, it's under scrutiny now in the Supreme Court, it means that the Supreme Court of Israel wants the farthest, widest right of free speech as it enables the Muslim extremists to be in the parliament as well. It's a philosophy of life in terms of our politics. But that doesn't mean that the Israeli public adheres to it, and I think in fact, that there are many voices in the Kud who think that they will pay every price for this. Well, <clears throat> that's um, a very handy link because I thought we might just say um, a few words about the upcoming election in Israel on April the 9th. I think it's almost impossible not to ask <laughs> what impact do you think the announcement last week of the plans to indict um, PM Netanyahu will have? on that election. Do you so, think you know, the last thing I wanted to do is to become a political commentator. <laughs> <laughs> last time I was the leading candidate to uh, challenging Benjamin Netanyahu. I founded the Zionist Union with my colleague Tzipi Livni and we gave hope to a major camp. Now there is a different uh, camp that was established, a centrist camp, and it's going to be very fascinating elections. So I don't intend to comment on the merits of what you mentioned. 
because they you know they, they, we are in a political roller coaster i just sincerely hope that the emotions that are flaring up all the way sky up high will not be trans transformed into more physical uh, emotions and but for big violence because it's very tense in israel now and just shows you the, the wide range of voices and a political game we have about 70 parties running in this election it shows you how far it goes and uh, people want to express themselves it's worthy it's interesting the, uh, the i would say the sub communities as one can term it politically meaning like the arab uh, voters with their political uh, competition with two major parties but about four or five parties the ultra orthodox communities including the, vi the fight of women to be elected in that community the fact that they've gone down in numbers is a phenomenon the fact that they're in Bet Shemesh, a Haredi city there's a women, woman male is all show major changes in all spheres of Israeli society and the same will be at the end in the election results and I think it's a, it's an open race it's an interesting race and uh, we need to wait and see on two things number one which will be the biggest party number two which party can form the biggest block and thereafter remember the president has to decide to whom to uh, appoint as the one who will form the government so the issue of the indictment without going into details definitely has a, a major bearing on all the situations that i've just mentioned and do you think the um, advent of Benny Gantz in the race is, um, well, he seems to be making ground, doesn't he, with the coalition with Yale? So year, I'll say the following again, I'm <coughs> keeping in line with the fact that I don't intend being a commentator. I'm pushing him, though. I, You're going uh, to have to come in behind we're, me in a minute. We're gossiping <laughs> politics. So I'll say the following. Number one, the Likud brand is a very strong brand in Israel. It's a very strong party. First of all, it's a big party, 120,000 members. It's, a very, it's one of the three last remaining fully democratic parties. The rest are parties of, of leaders who appoint their uh, list. Um, and the Likud brand is strong. Netanyahu's brand is very strong. But if he, even if he's eroded, then there's the Likud brand. That's why he's amassing. Uh, the Likud to, su to support him now. And Benny Gantz, what he did was to form a, a coalition. What I did, I went with the Livni, I took a centrist leader because I understood that in order to win in Israel, you have to come from the center. Israeli elections are decided in the center of the political map, not from the left or not from the extreme right. So therefore you have to shift to the center. Now, I shifted a certain sense to the center, but not enough. Clearly not, not enough. The fact that Benny Gantz is former chief of staff, together with Moshe Bogi Alon, not only former chief of staff, but former minister of defense of Benjamin Netanyahu and a Likud leader, and more right, and coupled with Yair Lapid, who's a centrist leader, and supported by Gabi Ashkenazi, another former chief of staff clearly stages them straight in the center, even center soft, uh, soft right, which poses a major challenge to Likud. So it's basically almost neck to neck now. Amazing. So Mick, what impact do you think this election in Israel is likely to have on the Israeli diaspora relationship? <coughs> well, I think that um I think it's going to be divisive in Israel, and I think it's going to be divisive in the diaspora. Um, and I think it comes back to the point that we alluded to a little earlier, but never developed, and that was the issue of the um, the tone of the debate uh, that takes place amongst the diaspora jury, um, which has become so very divided and very acrimonious. It's polarized, um, yeah, isn't it? very polarized, and with almost both sides denying, denying each other the space and the legitimacy, not only to, to have views, but, to, but, but also to comment on their views. And I think that division and, and divisiveness in, is, in Israeli politics as it plays out, 
feeds into that narrative uh, in, into the diaspora as well. So, um, I mean, I, 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 I applaud Israel's democracy, um, but it is, uh, it is a democracy uh, which is centered on the sort of chaos of a, a highly proportional system. And we, we, we've lived with that as Jews, you know, all through Israel's, Israel's existence. Um, but unfortunately, it feeds in to, to the sense of polarization that is now developing in the diaspora. And I, I really fear for diaspora Jewry unless we can get on top of that. We have to create a space where we actually respect people's rights to have views. And provided they're centered around, I think, four key propositions, that there is no debate about the fact that Israel is a legitimate, is a legitimate state, amongst the, the community of, of, of states, and it is a national state of the Jewish people, that there is no, um, there's no, there's no doubt about the fact that we all stand behind Israel's right for security, uh, that there's no right that we stand behind the fact that Israel should be a liberal democracy with the, all the values that go with that, and there should be no doubt that we stand behind the fact that there needs to be a long-term solution uh, to the Palestinians legitimate rights for self-determination and provided we can stand behind those issues we should be able to have discussions which are respectful and which we can learn from but at the moment it doesn't seem that we are in that space and I don't think that to some extent Bibi Netanyahu convinced the people of Israel that they could have a great life and not and we don't have to deal with the problem of peace, that you can have everything you want without tackling that issue. And so it stayed on the shelf for a very long time. Now I'm going to... If I just can, can add a comment on this. It's First of all, you have to remember that uh, there's also an option of a national unity government, namely a centrist coalition. I am a huge supporter of that for years. I actually paid in my career for the fact that I tried to form one with Netanyahu so that he go both to a peace process to block certain problematic legislation that hampers our democratic, liberal against democracy. Advice. Against his advice, that's true. And, uh, and, I'm listening to him. and also on the issue of Israel diaspora. The Jewish Agency placed on its uh, website, on Twitter and on Facebook this evening a a little video by youngsters from all of the <coughs> Jewish diasporas asking the Israeli leadership, what's your platform on Israel diaspora relations in order to ignite a certain discourse as to the importance of the diaspora in Jewish, uh, in Israeli public life. Thank you. Thank you. Right, I think we've got time for a few questions from the audience. Brilliant. So, um, and the first person I've gotten, um, I'll just have to say or describe who you are because I don't can't know your names. The gentleman in the white shirt. Should we take um, to identify the first three, and we'll take three questions and then um, come back to the panel. So, so the gentleman in the white shirt will be first, and then I'll come down to the gentleman in the blue, uh, pale blue. Is it pale blue? Or am I colorblind? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, it's very, it's very... <laughs> you wear whatever color you like. It looks fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> it's you. <laughs> Sorry. And then the gentleman there, in whatever color he's wearing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go. Um, thank you both. Uh, you commented at length about the nature of the relationship between the diaspora and Israel and about the divisive conversations that are happening within the diaspora. Can I ask you both just to go into a little bit more detail about the differences between the diaspora community perhaps here in Britain and the United States? Do, do, do you think what we see happening in the United States is the direction the community here is going in or there are, are, are there some fundamental differences between the British Jewish community and the American Jewish community. Okay, so I Take this gentleman, oh, we're going to get three. Uh, it was that gentleman there and then this one here. It's just, oh, you already got your microphone. God, that's so efficient as well. Really brilliant. Um, Do you want to hold on for a minute? Sure, sure. Yes. Um, I wanted to ask about the rift between the diaspora and Israel. And if I can respectfully disagree, even though I'm not a close friend of either of you, so I don't have really have to hold back. Surely the fact that the Minister of Education 
visiting Pittsburgh after the massacre, refusing to go to the shul because it was a conservative shul, speaks volumes of the Dubmaish, the personal example that the diaspora expects to come out of Israel. But it's Forget not true. It. It's simply not true. That's why I'm coming to the fake news. That's not true. Yeah, I'm coming to the fake news of how fake news, news is disseminated through the social media. Where the Sochnut, where, where you guys, and this is where I'm not going to have to hold back, did not come out before your time and take a really strong stand on the fact that fake news and populism, which is spreading right the way through the world, now the excuse that it's spreading everywhere doesn't justify Israel's use of BB or TB. Right, this is the slogan that's now being thrown around the election. So my question in short form is, how do you cross this roof where young people are stepping away? Just have a look around the demographics of this audience. It should speak volumes. We need to get to the universities and we are not succeeding. And we don't know how. Thank you. And the third question. Thank you for this uh, uh, inspiring discussion. Um, uh, there are more and more voices in the parliament, including in the Likud, calling for full annexation of, of the West Bank. And uh, I would like to ask you, Sir McDavis, how do you think that reality affect uh, uh, the, the relations of, uh, of Jewish diaspora in Israel, and whether unity is possible in in such future scenario. Thank you. Okay. So, Mick, do you want to address some of those points with the divisive conversation, the, the rift, the difference between the USA and the UK? Okay, so, so I'm, I'm happy to pick up um, the, the UK um, US differentiation, and I'll pick up the point that you raised, sir. Um, I'll, I'll leave the other point for, for, for Bougie, because I think yeah. that was more directed to, towards, towards him. Um, I think clearly there are obviously are substantial differences between the UK community and the US community. Uh, the demographic of the community is, is different. Um, ours is a, a community which is principally made up of, um, of a, a very significant of central orthodox affiliated people um, and uh, with the non-orthodox uh, being of smaller numbers, uh, whereas in the US it's the exact opposite. Um, and, and therefore many of the issues which arise in Israel in relation to Israel's relationship with the non-Orthodox are felt much more acutely uh, in the United States than they would be felt here. I'm not saying that we are ignorant or, or dismissive of them, but that is that is a fact. I think the the, the but the probably the most significant uh, difference is this: that probably because of distance, but because of affiliation and and history, that. Um, Jews in the United Kingdom are much more connected to Israel by virtue of the fact that they visit there often. Um, over 90% of Jews have had at least one visit to Israel in the United Kingdom. 60% of Jewish kids go to Israel um, at, the age of, uh, at the age of 16. Um, many people have families, have homes, and so this, this, the connection to Israel is very real and very profound in their lives and plays out therefore in the way that they think about themselves as Jews in the United Kingdom. In the United States that's not the case. So as is the case with generally with the general population in the United States, traveling outside the United States is a much rarer occurrence than it is out of the UK. So their visits and, con and physical connection to Israel is actually much lower. Um, and also I think that the um, the, the, the issues, if you, had, if you had to track young people, and there was a, there was a, a, a the Pew Foundation did the survey a few years ago, and asked them what are the things that are most critical to their sense of their being Jewish, actually connection to Israel was not, not near, anywhere near the top of the list. Um, and I think that is, a, that is, an, important, that is a, a, an important factor. What is happening, which is similar, uh, to the UK and the United Kingdom is, 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 is uh, to the USA and the United Kingdom is, is the way that Israel plays out politically. So for many years Israel was not a division along political lines within the United States. Whereas today that, you get a sense that that is actually happening. There is a political differentiation which is taking place 
in this country, without doubt, there's a political differentiation that has taken place. That the, the party that is seen to be in favorum of Israel, the Conservative Party, the party that's seen not to be in favorum of Israel is the Labour Party. That is, that, is, that is a new phenomenon in the United Kingdom. And that division between Republicans and Democrats is a new phenomenon as well. And it actually upsets the balance that, that, that is held amongst Jews in terms of who they normally connect to. Now, in this country, a large body of Jewish people found their natural home, political home, was in the Labour Party. And in the same way that uh, our chair lady tonight felt that the party has left her, so they felt the party has left them and they are in a political wilderness. And uh, in the United States, I think that that might be, well be a direction of travel at some point in, in, time, as, in time as well. Um, I think that the, the issue of, of annexation of the West Bank would be fundamental for the diaspora community if that had to happen. One of the greatest, when I talk about our obligations as a community, one of our obligations is to go and speak for Israel, to be advocates for Israel. One of the greatest weapons that we actually had in the advocacy was the fact that we were prepared to take the painful decision to trade land for peace. You remove that from the diaspora community, then you, you take away what sits at the heart of the capacity to fight and advocate, and advocate for Israel. Now, even if we think that Bibi Netanyahu has, is not as committed to you know, a two-state solution as he suggested in 2009, nevertheless, <coughs> as far as we stand today, it is the policy of Israel, the Israeli government, is to find an accommodation with the Palestinians, which give right at the end of the day to two states, to two people. <coughs> and, um, and if that annexation takes place, that completely rewrites that whole proposition. And I think that would be a tremendous trauma for the Asper Jews to have to cope with. Thank you, sir. And I would <coughs> add, of course, uh, that uh, when it comes to it, I, I don't think, you know, people agreeing to annexation of the whole West Bank. There may be a, a suggestion to annex the settlement blocks, but remember that President Trump promises uh, to lay down, put on the table uh, the ultimate deal very soon. So it's, it's, everything is unpredictable right now, this stage on this front. Uh, just to add on, the, on, on American jury, one has to remember, in American jury, the, it's a very institutionalized community as it pertains to the Jewish streams. So reform and conservative comprise of 85% of American Jewry. That's a 6 million Jew, or even bigger by now. There are, there are new census coming out to be 7 or 8 million uh, Jews. It's a huge number. And uh, most of them are not represented in Israel, for example. Or not, or, uh, and in England, uh, as, as, as Mick mentioned, the other factor is Hebrew schools, Hebrew day schools, Jewish schools. Uh, in, in relative numbers in America, they're small. Youth movements in America don't exist at all. We, we established youth movements and bring in all the youth movements to communities, but it's a drop in the sea. So the whole institutionalized structure of American Jewry is different. Couple it with about you know, 25 to 30 percent assumed unaffiliates, and you have a different perception of the activity of Jewish life in America, which has direct effect on what we call the rift. Last comment, I keep on telling American Jewry as much as I can, because 70 percent are affiliated with the Democratic Party. You cannot, well, I mean, let's put it this way. We should not make Israel pay the price for the fact that there's Donald Trump or Bibi Netanyahu or vice versa. The relationship between Israel and the diaspora should go historically way beyond any political leader at any given time. Because we pay a lot of the frustrations that come out because of the a good close relationship between Do Donald Trump and Netanyahu and vice versa. And I tell my American friends, had I, been, had I been Prime Minister of Israel, I would have spent my time as Prime Minister of Israel in the Oval Office, just like Netanyahu, because it has to do with Israel's security. So get, get above that. We can argue on anything, but not on the fact that 
the American people elected a certain president and the Israeli people are a certain prime minister. <laughs> Shall we take just three, a, a, a few more questions? I think everybody looks like they can manage another five, ten minutes. Can I see if there's any, any women putting their hands up? Yeah? Fantastic. So I'm going to take that lady there. Um, yeah? And the next one, so someone can get ready with the microphone, is the lady right at the back. Yeah? And someone over this side? Anybody over this side? No? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah? This yeah. gentleman, that's right. Yeah. You know who you are. Make sure they see you when you come, they come with the microphone. Okay. I'm not going to get everybody in, you know that, because we'd have to stay till about 11 o'clock. Um, so let's go. Where are we? That lady. I believe um, I'm right in saying that since Ambassador Mark Regev was the um, <coughs> official government correspondent, there has never been a replacement of his caliber. Uh, the only news that we get, either be it Sky or BBC or ITV, is from biased reporters who don't give a true picture. Isn't it time that someone replaced Mark Regev? Okay. And it's the lady at the back. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask, and you touched on it briefly, about clashes of values between the diaspora and Israel. And Naftali Bennett, who is the Minister of Education, but also Minister for Diaspora Affairs, recently said that um, the things that we're told that the diaspora care about that affects their relationship to Israel, like egalitarian prayer at the Western Wall and stuff to do with the Palestinians, is not the issue. And the issue is that diaspora Jews are assimilating and that they are apathetic about their Jewish identity, um, which is kind of an insult to diaspora Jews. And he holds the portfolio of, of diaspora Jewry. And I, and I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about where you see that clash of values going, because it seems to me that the thing that is driving a wedge between the diaspora and Israel is exactly that type of comment, a comment which dismisses the concerns of the diaspora and blames the diaspora for that rift that is growing. Thank you. I'm the gentleman there. Thanks, um, uh, Ms. Ryan. The question is actually for you, which is quite unusual to ask the moderator a question, but it is also very unusual to have the privilege of watching being part of a person <coughs> like you, of your caliber, at this time, at a time of great trauma for the Jewish community in this country, moderate a panel two great leaders. So thank you for that. And my question is a simple one. For a diaspora to have a voice, it has to have, it has to be allowed a voice in a context in the diaspora. And the context is quite distressing just now in the UK. Could you please, if you can, uh, if you're able to, can you comment on how you think the Labour Party appointment of either Lord Falconer or whomever will play out? And if you, if you could, if you could uh, comment on whether you believe a Lord Falconer would be the right kind of person to lead such a review. Okay. So, um, I'll start with the answer on, on the whole issue of values. I think it's a very good qu uh, question, and especially I told Naftali Bennett I disagreed with his comments. But I want to make something clear. I think the fact that we take a quote from a certain person and we think that's it, that's the only thing he believes in, is unfair. And if Tali Bennett was differently from the other side of the aisle when I was in Parliament, but on many, many things that pertaining to diaspora affairs, he, we see eye to eye. And he definitely believes in dialogue with all the Jewish streams, as opposed to what was said. And in Pittsburgh, he was the first one to get there to the ceremony, and I followed suit that way, weekend, and I saw what he did. So I, I think it was a, a major mistake in the way he defined it, but that doesn't represent what the general perception of the relationship is also by him. Now I'm here not to defend him. I'm here to say how it should be. I'm a huge believer in pluralism and I believe pluralism between all the streams should be applied in Israel and it's what I advocate morning and night as noon and evening in Israel. I tell diaspora jury, Israel loves you. It's not the, that Israel doesn't respect you, it's the Rabbanut who decided not to recognize you. It's two different things, 
And that's a different political battle to deal with. But I can say that knowing American Jewry really well, you see in America, I've seen whereby you see in most of the forums, rabbis from all the streams getting together and the tension between the streams in America is much less than you see anywhere else in the world. And I hope that will also come to Israel. I'm trying to convince most opinion makers and rabbis in Israel to start talking to each other because we don't have the privilege of fighting. And the problem with Jewish people historically is that when there is less risk at their doorstep, existential, for example, in this era, relative terms, in this very moment, let's say, there's less of an existential threat on the Jewish people. Then that's when the Jewish people starts quarreling from within, rather than uniting and dealing with all the challenges of the day. So when it comes to egalitarian prayers, for example, I have the copyrights on the prayers in the Wailing Wall in the egalitarian hotel in Robinson's Arch. I devised it in 99, following major riots in there, and it was a solution agreed by all, including all the rabbis of Wall Street. <laughs> Unfortunately, extremists from all sides led it to blow up in a few years ago. The government <laughs> decided to adopt a, an agreement, which was historical, and then rescinded it, which creates a lot of pain for brothers and sisters all over the world. And we are trying, and the Jewish agency was very active in trying to carve out that settlement. My predecessor, Nathan Shoransky, was a hero in trying to work on it. Unfortunately, Netanyahu rescinded because of political pressure. But that doesn't mean that the government is not trying unilaterally to upgrade the egalitarian prayer site. And I think at the end, if political circumstances will allow, it's a must that we resolve that issue before it becomes thorny. Unfortunately, there are many forces who are treading on this for their own political cash. And that is why I tell everybody, the fact is, if a politician says stupid things, that doesn't mean that all of Israel thinks that way. Especially as it pertains to voices we hear here and there about the streams. And I believe that in general, if we look at the historical perception, a perspective, all in all, there's constant improvement when it comes to the presence of pluralistic views in Israel. It was uncustomary un historically, and it's moving slowly towards that direction. Mark Regev, official Mark staff. Regev, I think, is an outstanding ambassador. I commend him. I think he's an excellent civil servant, and he's not to blame for, for views that you did disagree with. Well, I think what the lady was asking was... Um, no, she said, when are you replacing him? Are, are we the government? So I, so I didn't get it. It hasn't been a person as good as Mark. Ah, so you say he's good? Yes. Yeah. So I thought the question was, when are you replacing Mark Reagan? No, no, no. He's not replaced as government spokesperson. And he was really... I good. mean, you, okay, English-speaking government spokesperson. Yeah. None of us here represent the Prime Minister of Israel. We have to ask the Prime Minister of Israel. Mark is really excellent. Smek, do you want to say something on this clash of values? I'm sorry, I apologize, I misunderstood. No, I, 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 um, I, I agree that, uh, that you can't ask um, the Aspect communities in any way to park their values at the door in terms of the engagement with Israel. And nor can you actually try and turn the situation around and say that it's not us, but it's you. But there is an important thing here that I think that we need to actually think about uh, as a final comment about the potential of younger people in particular uh, to distance themselves from Israel. And that it's not all about the tensions and, and the struggles. and. You know, my daughter's just gone on Aliyah, and I've encouraged her all her life to both uh, hug and wrestle with Israel. In other words, to love Israel for what it is and everything that it represents and the great things that, that it does. Uh, at the same time, to wrestle with the complexities, um, because unless people wrestle with them, you don't make improvement. But I, I think we have to acknowledge that people living in emancipated society in the West even today, with the, 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 the advent of sort of a new wave of anti-Semitism, that their search for meaning in their personal lives 
is particularly possible and resonant within a broader civil society. And they don't have to find meaning in their lives in terms of a connection with Israel. And so when we think about the challenge of young people's connectivity to Israel, it isn't, that challenge isn't centered around solely about a clash of values. It's actually centered about who they want to be and how they want to find meaning and whether, whether being Jewish, whether being Zionist is an important part of that. And I think we're dealing in society where it's very easy for people to find meaning through other more universal, universal sort of attributes than necessarily through a Jewish root. And our obligation as parents, as grandparents, as leaders of communities is to inspire young people as they search for meaning that their primary focus of meaning can be found, can resonate in a deep connection with Israel and a deep connection with the Jewish roots. Um, <clears throat> Charlie Falkner and the situation in the Labour Party. Um, I think Charlie Falkner is a good man and I think he will try his best to resolve the problem. But I think it's, I think what I'd call fool's gold because I don't think the problem can be resolved um, in the way that it's been approached. Because what's happening is, you might have seen on um, Sophie Ridge on Sky, Sky on Sunday, that John McDonnell said it's just 0.1% of members. First of all, if it's so few, if it's such a little tiny problem, why has it taken three and a half years to find any way to resolve it? Why is it that every day almost, certainly every week, we're presented with a new way in which this problem is going to be resolved, is going to be tackled, is being dealt with, and within hours of the announcement, it all unravels. And I think I know why it is. And <coughs> Luciana Berger, I think, was the beginning of really putting her finger on the issue. She said it's institutional anti-Semitism, institutional racism. I suggested on Sky News on Sunday that they really need to go back and read McPherson. But first of all, it's not a matter of the numbers, though I think the numbers are a little bigger than John McDonnell would have us believe. It's not a matter of numbers. It's institutional racism is within your very organisational structures, within your processes and within your ideology. That's the problem. So, as with all the goodwill in the world that I think Charlie will bring to this, I don't think he can resolve it because the problem is at the top, in their thinking, in the political ideology. I find that really sad, but I don't think the problem can be solved because either they would have to go, and they're not going to, or they would have to change, and they're not going to. And we've seen that over three and a half years. And that's why I concluded that change can't happen and I can't say you're fit to be Prime Minister. I can't go to the voters again and say it. So I think Tom Watson has done some sterling work. I hope we opened the door to that a couple of weeks ago. He is a friend to the community and I hope he manages to do even more. I hope our group grows but I hope, against hope, that we do not see Jeremy Corbyn in number 10. And I hope these two gentlemen have got some influence, because I might need to make Alia after this. <laughs> I think he has been and is a, an excellent ambassador um, and I was in the foreign office for some time as a special envoy and um, so I've met quite a lot of ambassadors over the, over the years and I do think he's an excellent ambassador. He has um, been a great source of uh, support and help to us without ever crossing the lines that diplomats have to follow. 
despite the fact that there are those who think that the Israeli embassy has given me a million pound. <laughs> I don't know where they put it, but I haven't got it. <laughs> I shouldn't joke about that, actually. It's quite a terrible, serious um, thing, that so-called undercover <laughs> operation of Al Jazeera, that tried to smear, um, I think, not just me, but lots of decent people. Um, OK, I think we're really coming to the end. I've got one last question for um, our, our guests, and I'm going to start with um, Samit. G given that we are talking about the relationship of the diaspora to Israel, um, <coughs> do you think, you know, will your children and your grandchildren be as connected to Israel as your generation has been? Well, I'd, I'd like to say emphatically yes, um, and um, so I know some. Of, if I talk about personally, I know some of my children will be. I can't. I can't talk for all, all my children. Um, but if I talk about in, in a more universal sense, will future generations of Jewish people coming in the United Kingdom be as connected as our generation has been, and, and my parents' generation? I think it's it's moot. Um, I think that there are. A lot of forces at, at, at work here, which are going to um, which are going to be very stressful for emerging generations, and I think it's going to require that connection that we've been speaking about, and where Bruges and I slightly differed, perhaps in, in emphasis, but that connection between the Jewish state and the Jewish and all of the Jewish people, but the Jewish people who live outside their state, that connection is going to have to be built stronger and stronger over time so that we share values, we share experiences, and we share a language. If we can do that, then I have hope. But if we fail there, then I think inevitably those bonds will, will start withering over time. Can I put the other side of the coin to you, Beji? Do you think young people in Israel um, feel as connected to the diasporas as your generation has? So in fact, I think there is actually a, an improvement in terms of the young generation in Israel because of the connectivity of the life we live in, because of the web, because of birthright, which uh, as part of the fact that it brings about half of the cohort of young Jews from America each year, uh, they, con they, they are obliged to meet with his, their Israeli counterparts because of Massa, which is a major program of the Jewish Agency that brings around 14,000 young Jews to live in Israel between two months and a year, and many, many, many other programs, including UJIA programs and others, and the exposure of young Israelis to that. I actually feel that the fact that we send out about a few hundred young Shinshin, namely 18-year-olds pre-army kids to the communities, including here in the UK, creates a, um, a cadre of young Israelis who will take leadership roles in the future, who are exposed to the story of the diaspora, nothing like my generation, which, because of my studies in the United States, exposed me to the story of the diaspora, but most Israelis were, not, were unexposed. So, yes, the, the real challenge is what you've asked Mick, namely how do we make sure that the next generations are staying Jewish? In terms of frightening numbers, in relative terms, like in America, the assumption is that two generations down the road, it will be 16% of what they have today. But that's instead of, in, in that's, in, that's in, if you interpret the dry numbers, okay, because of interfaith marriage. But we can also change that formula upside down. It requires a lot of efforts. Mick mentioned some of them. We are working on a variety of tools and options and programs, and also on the fact that I believe that the religious Salahic establishment needs to meet the challenge by dealing seriously on the issue of conversion. It's a different evening we can spend the whole night on, but I sincerely believe that in this current era where there are many people who knock on our doors and want to be part of our nation, we should find ways and means to be bold enough to deal with it. So all in all, it's a whole big array of issues. 
the ch this is exactly the challenge that we are dealing with. How do we keep our children Jewish and grandchildren Jewish? I will end by one ex uh, interesting data. So there is a book that came out in Israel, which is called Israeli Judaism. It's a research by two great experts on how Israelis perceive their Judaism. So on the question of do you think your kids will stay Jewish and grandkids, it was like 90% said easily yes, which is interesting. It's nothing to compare to the diaspora. And the rest was what does it mean Israeli Judaism, which is a unique form of centrist type mixture of lifestyles and Judaism, not necessarily the former of the former, but also not necessarily the most secular of them all. So it's interesting. A lot of things will develop in future generations. And our role, obligation as leaders of the Jewish people is to make sure that it goes to the right direction. Thank you for your hospitality. we um, again show our gratitude to our two guests um, I say our two guests because I'm the moderator so that doesn't include me but honorary citizen of Israel <laughs> <laughs> what I want to say is that um, it, it, it's been a fascinating discussion and the connection between the diaspora and Israel and it's clearly a really important topic to the Jewish community and sometimes perhaps those of us who are not Jewish, um, I think we don't always understand. I've come to understand the importance of the relationship between Jewish diasporas and Israel, but I'm not sure I did understand that when I first became chair of Labour Friends of Israel. I've learned that. Um, and I think it's a really important thing to understand about the community and its heart and its soul. And, and I think it helps when people do understand it. But it's very hard to communicate it in, in the progressive space at the moment because of the anti-Zionism. But what I wanted to say to you as a community is I um, feel very proud of my connection with you. And I feel very proud of under terrible provocation, much from my own party, as was, that I feel deep shame about, I think you have stood up to that with strength. You've spoken out, but you've done it with dignity. And it's an object lesson of dealing as a community with racism. And it makes it easy for, uh, easier for those of us who will stand up to do so with some courage when we see your courage. Thank you very much. but who gave us some very illuminating answers. Thank you, Bijan. Thank you. And, and those of you that know us know that we are committed all year round to providing multiple entry points for people to find meaningful Jewish lives that you spoke of before. Um, and you will find plenty of both hugging and wrestling that goes on here uh, with regards to the Jewish community's relationship with Israel all year round. So take the chance to pick up one of the brochures and have a look through. Find something else that maybe takes you out of your comfort zone when it comes to Jewish life in Israel and come and join us again. Um, it was a great honour to be in the room and hear the three of you speak tonight. So on behalf of everyone at Genevieve 3, thank you for finding time in your extremely busy diaries to be here. One last round of applause to show. Thank you.